What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Exotic Astrology. And today I am greatly honored to have Vic Dikara in my channel. So he is very famous, and we all know him for his wonderful work and the knowledge which he has on Akshatra. So welcome. Namaste. Thank you so much. Namaste. Very, very fortunate to have you here. Thank you. So I will pin his channel below. So I hope everybody subscribes and I think already most of you are already subscribers. So today I thought of asking you about planetary dignity that, uh, for example, there are planets which get debilitated in their own uh, friend signs. For example, moon gets debilitated in Scorpio and get, Mars gets debilitated in um, Cancer. So although they are friend signs, so how do you see that, that just because, for example, say Saturn stays in Gemini, so does that mean is it good or bad? How do you see those placements? Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Recording again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I think we have. Uh, I'm just. I'm going to switch it to a gallery view so you can see both of us at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have two interesting related questions. One is what's the logic behind exaltation? And one is how do you evaluate dignity, right? Now, yes. they're related questions for sure because exaltation is one of the states of dignity. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, I would like to just say a word or two about what dignity is. In English, the word dignity is very interesting. Why is mm -hmm. it called dignity? When I think of a dignified person, I think of a person who drinks their tea with their pinky out. Big man. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, a sophisticated person, a high class person, right? Yeah. So, so why dignified? Why is the planet dignified? <laughs> well, if, the idea is it is actually associated with somebody who's high class and wealthy, if you're dignified. Oh, okay. if, you have, if you have a lot of stuff... If you, if you have money and you have an, a home and you have food, then you're not likely to go out and rob a bank, right? Or you're not likely to steal from your neighbor or anything like that because you already have everything. You have the basic things that you need. Yes. So the, the condition that you're in affects your behavior. And then you'll see then quite the opposite is, you know, the same person, if they're forced to live in poverty, they have no roof over their head, the same person will maybe pick up a knife and threaten somebody to get their money. It's the same person, but under certain circumstances, they'll behave in a certain way that can be called undignified. Wow. And another condition, they'll behave in a way that's called dignified. So the idea behind the planets with the dignity is they get into a certain mood by being in a certain place. Ah. Oh. Right, so that's why it's related with signs, because signs are the places. Signs are the division of, the, of space, the actual space, the places that the planets move through. So if you put a planet, like let's say you put Mars in a place where he's very comfortable, like Aries. So he's got everything he needs. He feels happy. He's got his stuff around, right? His own house. He knows where everything is. So he's in a good mood. So he doesn't stab you or bite you or yell at you or anything because he's, he's comfortable, he's happy. But if you put Mars someplace that makes him feel uncomfortable, like let's say, I'm, of course I would want to say cancer, but then I would have to answer your dignity question right away. I mean, your, your debilitation question right away. Let's say Aquarius. Okay. Or Libra. Classically, yeah, typically you could just go right across from wherever the planet owns and you okay. would see a place where they would be pretty uncomfortable. Okay. Um, so let's just say Mars and Libra. Well, now he doesn't really know what's up over here. He's in this place that's, that's quite different from him on most counts. And he doesn't know what to do. So he, gets, he starts to feel pinched and he starts to feel frustrated. But here's where he's going to start to bite people and his, his negative side is going to come out. So any planet, say Mars will act good if it has good dignity. Mm -hmm. And what will Mars do if it's dignified? Well, it would give you a lot of courage, bravery, strength, initiative. Mars can act bad 
if it's in a bad dignity, what would it, what would it do in a bad dignity? It would make you uncooperative, independent, too independent. It would make, maybe make you get angry very easy, violent. Oh. Right? So you got a planet can bring out the good side of itself or the bad side of itself, depending on whether or not it feels happy or uncomfortable, which depends on how it likes the sign that it's in. That's the basic theory of dignity. Yes. Yes. So Vedic, Vedic astrology has a really nice system for figuring out dignity. Because um, we have these spectrums. Now the spectrum of exaltation on one hand is like the best. The planet feels actually inspired. <laughs> it's, more than, it's more than being at home. Yes, being yes. Your own sign. To be in his own sign, Mars, or some planet, any planet in his own sign, feels real comfortable. So they're dignified. But even more than comfortable is inspired. Oh. So there's the higher dignity, even still higher than own sign, is exaltation. And then the lowest sign is debilitation. Ucha and Nietzsche. So it's just like saying up and down. Is it high or low dignity? That's all they're saying. Ucha is high dignity, Nietzsche is low dignity. And this is like a spectrum of, and that's what exalt, same meaning as uch. It means yes, up yes, and debil means falling down. Yes. So, then in between those <laughs> spectrums, though, you got own signs, debilitation, and exaltation signs. In between that spectrum, in the West, Western systems, they take the opposite sign from the own, and they call it a fall or a detriment. I think they call it a detriment, detriment. which makes yes. good sense. That does make good sense, but. We have a nice system, more complicated, where we can figure out friendships. You know, you know about that system. The the natural relationship between the planet who owns the sign and the planet occupying the sign determines yes. a much more finer spectrum of middle range dignities there. But let's talk about exaltation and debilitation now what does that make sense what i said so far yeah yeah perfectly it makes sense anything i should elaborate if, on more if a planet is dignified he behaves in a very good way and if yeah. he's not dignified he can behave in a bad way that's what you meant yeah he'll behave yes. in a, he will <laughs> you know yes. he will behave in a bad way but of course yes. you never find a, you never find a planet zero percent dignified and okay you never find a planet hundred percent dignified even if you okay. say hey, Mars is in Cancer, it's debilitated. That should be zero, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, Mars is in Cancer, but what Amsha is Mars in? Okay. Is it really in, can is it in Cancer Navamsha too? Okay. Okay, if it's in Cancer Navamsha and Cancer Rashi, then maybe it's 100% zero, you know, fully zero. But then what about Shashnyamsa? Or what about all those Vargas? Yes. Right? So that's why in practice you find a planet rarely gets, um, rarely gets higher than or zero. You, it never gets higher than seventy five. I've seen one or two times charts with okay. eighty percent dignity, like okay. where one hundred is one hundred percent is is exalted, and you never see like oh. lower than twenty five. But you never have a planet that's fully fully bad, and yes. nor do you have a planet that's fully fully good. Yeah, and in this one thing I wanted to ask is uh, some people get confused that suppose now Mars is debilitated. Now, th does this mean that the person will use the Martian traits in a bad way or does it mean that the Martian traits will at all not be there? Because for that we have to see the moon and the flow of the chart, where the chart is flowing. So a criminal can have an exalted or a debilitated Mars. So how do you interpret the debility of Mars? Hmm. If Mars is debilitated, does it mean that the person doesn't have Mars qualities? Yeah. Or that they have bad? Well, actually, Mars in Libra or Mars in Taurus or sometimes just Mars in any feminine sign gives you the effect of taking away Mars qualities. Oh. You know, it will tip, cautionize, make the person more cautious, timid. It makes Mars more cautious, timid. Um, oh. Makes them more feminine. They lose the masculine quality <laughs> yeah okay okay and then if you put mars in cancer it's also it's a very feminine sign that's one of the reasons why most, most in fact feel comfortable there yeah but yeah. here the debilitation is actually more than just like 
a softening. It can be very oh. good actually to just soften the masculinity. So this person won't be very a- angry or they won't be very independent. They won't be ambitious. This can be nice if it goes nicely with the rest of the mix. Okay. But in, Mars and Cancer is likely to be strong emotions that are hard to express, hard oh. to deal with, that are frustrating, and the anger can boil up a lot. Ah, oh, okay. So it doesn't mean that the person will not have anger. It means that can come out in some other form. Anger will be problematic. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. Now, as you, as you already alluded to, we're talking about Mars in isolation. Because we have to. Yes. There's no other way to talk about things unless you learn it in isolation. But everybody should just bear in mind that here we're talking clinically. Yeah. You know, about Mars in isolation as a theory. In practice, Mars is never in isolation. Oh, yeah. All others are impacting and influencing. Yeah. And you have to see how does the condition of Mars, how does it, how does it get along with the rest of the conditions in the chart? So you may have even a Mars that's debilitated. Mm-hmm. Question number one is how debilitated is it? Is it really 100% oh, debilitated? Probably not. But question number oh. two is, all right, so this means the person has difficulty with passion and feelings. Well, what does the rest of the chart say? Oh, if you okay. never see that anywhere else in the rest of the chart, then it's not that important. And but it if, is even less important if the dasa of Mars also doesn't come, the Mahadasa. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's the same with moon also. I mean, uh, it also gets debilitated in Scorpio, although it's a friend sign. Right, we wanted to talk about that. Right? Yeah. Friends. Okay, so the general principle is friendship is a good dignity. If you're friends with the person whose, ha- whose sign you're in, you'll be pretty happy. Not as happy as if you were in your own spot. Uh-huh. Right. So, if, for example, if Mars goes into Leo, it's pretty happy there. Because they're friends. Yes. But not. But he's more. He's actually more happy in Scorpio or, or Aries, because this is his own yes. place. He knows where his God is, TV remote yes. control. He knows where he has his chips. He knows everything. <laughs> so. So then it would be strange that sometimes a planet would be debilitated in the house of its friend, right? Somebody may get confused with that, or it could be exalted. Mars is exalted in Capricorn. Yes, Venus, Pisces. But it really doesn't like Aquarius because it doesn't like Saturn so much. So Saturn's other sign really frustrates Mars, but Capricorn's bingo. Okay. (laughs) But understand the nature of what exaltation is and then it it will make more sense to you. Exaltation is a state of inspiration. Okay. This planet feels inspired. Okay. Because in order to get inspired, you have to have a little pinch you have to have okay. a little reason to improve. But there's okay. got to be something that's pinching you a little bit to make you move and make you... Oh, improve. yeah, yeah, yeah. Go high. But not too much. If there's okay. too much of a pinch, then you just feel pinched and you get in a bad mood. Oh, okay, okay. So what you'll find with all the exaltation signs that are ascribed to planets is most of the, of the planet and the sign goes great together. But there's something that gives it a pinch. Okay. So it's able to use the aspects of the sign that it goes great with to rise above that pinch and it rises up to its highest. It's like meeting a challenge and conquering a challenge. Okay, okay. You give okay. An, we could give the example of Mars, right? Mars and Capricorn. The thing that it doesn't like is Saturn. Right? Saturn owns Capricorn, so that's its pinch. But it's other stuff that it really likes is, this is a malefic sign. Mars is yes. a malefic planet. That's good. This is an important principle in, in astrology. When two things are the same, it makes a good yes. result. Even, oh. if it's, even if it's like sickness plus sickness, the result is health. Ah, okay. It's going in the same direction. If it's health plus sickness, the result is bad. If okay. it's wealth plus poverty, right? Like if you take a planet of wealth and you put it in a house of poverty or vice versa, that's an inter- interpretation as poverty take a planet of poverty and put it in a house of poverty that's wealth because things are going in the same direction Uh so you put a malefic in a malefic place it's good okay Okay. malefic also is a bad word um (laughs) meaning that it doesn't really describe the thing so well here the sanskrit word is much better kura 
It means tough. Tough. Uh -huh. Okay. Hard. hard. Malefic planets are hard. Somyas are soft. Okay. Benefic planets are soft, generous. They'll forgive us. Uh. Malefic planets don't forgive us. <laughs> it's like mom and dad. The classic mom and dad. Uh -huh. I mean, of course, every family is different, but like the arc stereotypical mom and dad. The dad isn't the one who forgives you. The mom forgives you. The mom is soft. The yeah. dad is the one who punishes you. <laughs> so malefics are like dad. They're not, they don't hate you. They're your dad. Uh huh. Okay. They love you. They're trying to help you improve, but they do it in a, by a strict, in a strict way. They set rules. Uh -huh. They don't forgive. Mom is also, she doesn't love you more than dad. They just have a different way of expressing the love and shaping the child. So benefics and malefics are like that. So, uh, what do you think that uh, if suppose Mars is not in Capricorn, it's yeah. in any other house, any other sign, but suppose it is conjunct with Saturn. So, do you think that this can yield some kind of a similar result? Well, I mean, no. On other things. No. no, because that's there's a special recipe about Mars and Capricorn that makes this work. Okay. But that recipe is not just there if you isolate Mars and Saturn. If you isolate Mars oh. and Saturn and put them together, in Japanese, we say it's a kenka. I like this word, kenka. That means okay. they fight. They fight each okay, other. They will fight. Okay. They don't get along. They have a similar nature. They're both tough. Okay. I see what you're saying. So you have tough plus tough. So does that make a good thing? Yeah, no, yeah, that is one and the other thing like because it is like the similar energy, Capricorn and Saturn. It's like so that's what I was thinking. Yeah, classically classically you wouldn't expect a combination of Mars and Saturn to give you a good result. Yeah. It's just gonna give you a t because it's indicating a place where you're gonna get punished and it's gonna be strict. Right. Oh is it because the two strict planets are there in that yeah, house? Right, right. It could come to bear if it's a place where malefics belong. You okay. know, there's Upachaya houses, three, ah. three and an eleven. If you got Mars and Saturn in one of those four, yes, they belong there. Ah, uh, so that toughness, punishing quality, strength, masculine dadness is welcome there. So maybe oh. Saturn and Mars there would be fine. A really strong person. Okay, and, and another I, thing regarding this dignity, they say that. Uh, suppose let's I'm talking on malefics here because that's yes. always most discussed. So they say that. Oh, if Mars is exalted, suppose, or suppose Mars is well placed, then they'll say, Oh, yeah, you will have a lot of courage, but that means you will have big enemies also. And if Saturn is exalted, you'll be very hard working. That means you have to work, 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 work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what is your opinion on that? Well, astrologers are always looking behind them to cover their backs. <laughs> Okay. Because we always make a we always make a predicament uh, prediction or something, and then we have to wonder yeah. like, what if I'm wrong? So we always say like, well, Saturn in this sign means this, except if blah 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 blah. Oh. So what I would say is, don't be afraid of saying Saturn. Uh, don't be afraid of saying Mars in Capricorn is fantastic. Yeah. But just remember that we're talking clinically and we're talking in isolation. Uh, yeah, only that thing. Yeah, only Mars and Capricorn is fantastic. If that's the whole chart, then this person is just successful in every endeavor because they're so confident and strong and determined and independent and they get their self-motivating everything. But maybe there's a chart where Mars is in Capricorn and everything else is supposed to be soft and timid. Oh, okay. Or maybe that Mars and Capricorn are actually, you really calculate the dignity out, like I said, by looking at the Amshas oh, okay. and doing okay. work from Shopaka. Uh -huh. And you actually calculate the dignity out and you say like, hey, this looks, this is, this is still exalted in the Rashi. Oh. But it doesn't have its full, it's not really exalted because actually overall speaking, it's in so many bad Amshas. Yeah, because if Mars is in Capricorn, it can be in the now Amsha in Cancer very well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and this is how you can get much easier way to figure out Nietzsche Banga and oh. Uch Banga <laughs> instead of going for like twenty a list of twenty five rules. Okay, you can okay. Check my Vargavim Shopaka. Oh. and it does the is the Vargavim Shopaka actually high? 
And if it's really high, then for this exalted planet, then yeah, this is a really exalted planet. But if it's really low, but the planet's exalted, you know that it's not really going to deliver on the interpretations of being exalted. Okay. And another thing I wanted to ask is regarding the functional malefics. Yeah. Like the because of the six eight twelve. So now there's this debate that if they are well placed <laughs> in a powerful dignity or in a kendra or in a good house, then it is good. That means they you will overcome those challenges. Now some say that those challenges will be very big if that that planet is exalted or it, if it's in a strong dignity. So what's your opinion on that? Ah, uh, this is a. Like for uh, Libra ascendant, if uh, Jupiter is in the tenth house, for example, ah. or for Capricorn, it's in the seventh house, for example. Okay, now that's a good principle. Um, there's two things to consider: one is prominence, mm-hmm. and one is dignity. Yeah. Okay. They're not. It's not the same. Like yes. You put Jupiter in the tenth house, it becomes more prominent because the tenth house okay. is prominent. It's okay. The, okay. It's yes. Uh, if Jupiter is not a good planet. You don't want them to be prominent, <laughs> right? Okay, okay. It's like okay. if you have somebody that wants to just, that hates you. If we have somebody that hates us, right? And they just uh. want to do something bad for us. Well, if they're nobody and they can't do anything, then okay, it sucks that somebody hates us, but they're not going to be able to do anything terrible to us, right? Because they, they're powerless. Okay. But if you have somebody that hates you and they're like the king of the country that you live in, you better leave the country. <laughs> so on, or on the other hand, if you have somebody that just loves you and wants to give you everything, but they don't have anything. Oh. Then, okay. That feels, that feels wonderful that this person loves me, but I'm not going to get anything tangible out of this. Oh. So if you have a person that really wants to benefit you and they're the king of the country, and you just hit the jackpot. So you want to put really, ideally, if you want to have like the successful life, you want to have the really dignified planet be very, very prominent. You okay. want to have the undignified planet be very out of the way. Get it out okay. of the way. That's the other thing too. You might have Mars and Cancer. So, oh my God, I have all these anger problems. But maybe that Mars and Cancer is not really so prominent. Okay. So okay. it's not a big issue in your life. Yeah, you get angry when you don't know how to control your anger, but you don't get angry that often. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what sometimes I think that suppose for Capricorn ascendant, if Jupiter sits in the fifth house, because it is the twelfth lord. I mean, ignoring the concept that is also the third lord. But if I only take that it's a twelfth lord, so then uh, have you seen that it damages the significant significations of the fifth house? I'm not talking of Karak Bhavanas here, but twelfth lord in the fifth. So even though it's a good. Yeah, well, that's the thing. The 12th Lord and the 5th house. You got to be not afraid to. If you're going to be an astrologer or learn about astrology, you have to be fearless. So you can't be afraid to say, yeah, this is a bad sign. Okay. Right? It's a bad sign. It's just You got the 12th Lord, the Lord of loss in the house of children or in the house of love. Right? The okay. Fifth so it's ah. going to damage the 5th house. Fine. But that's not like your reading is done there. Oh, yes. You know what I mean? And it, you're reading, that's one of the re- parts of the recipe that goes into the whole reading. How is the dignity of this 12th Lord? Um, yes, yes. What kind of aspects does this 12th Lord have? Okay. Stuff like that. What and are the other then, indicators of this, this theme? Like, for example, with the 12th Lord in the fifth house, one thing that, and also usually anything that gives you something bad also gives you something else good. Like 12th Lord okay. in the fifth house is pretty good for intellect, actually. Okay. Because the intellect has to work with abstract patterns. It doesn't, okay. intellect doesn't work with like. The s- standard. Like, yeah, it's not a hammer. The intellect is not a hammer hitting a nail. The oh, intellect okay. is working with ideas, right? So the 12th house is very ideal oriented. You don't find any hammers in the 12th house, no nails. You don't find any rocks, marbles. Everything there is gaseous it's, and ideal. or abstract. Abstract. So 12th house in the fifth. 12th Lord in the fifth house, it's good on one hand for abstract intelligence or spiritual uh, ability to grasp philosophy and have some inspiration towards spiritual thinking is good with the fifth, 12th and the fifth, but it's not good for giving passion, like romantic love, passion, uh, procreation. It's not good for that. 
So it can be good for a sannyasi to have 12th Lord in the fifth house. Right? Nobody wants that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody wants the sannyasi yoga. Um, wait, wait, then what was your other question? Yeah, another thing I wanted to ask is, suppose they talk of this Parivartan yoga. So suppose the seventh Lord and twelfth Lord are in Parivartan. So there is this saying that when uh, the prominent lords of the Kendra or Trikonas, they undergo Parivartan with the Dusthanas. So then it is said that that person, instead of focusing on that Kendra, is focusing on the Dusthana. <laughs> ah. What is your opinion on this? So suppose 12th Lord and 7th Lord. Are That's a good question. Okay, but can I rewind the tape and go back? Because while you were asking me the question, I remembered why I was talking about what I was talking about in the previous thing. Can yeah, I just yes. finish up my thing on the, the, the previous yeah, one yeah. and then we'll go? Yeah. So like the point is there's several effects that you'll get from any one placement. Okay. Right? Twelfth Lord in the fifth house, you got good. It's good for spiritual intellect. It's good for abstract thinking, but it's bad for uh. passion and romance. So how do you know which one is which? Oh, okay. You know, this is the other important thing about astrology is we have multiple witnesses for any event. Yeah, and we need to call. We need to ask multiple witnesses. If you just ask one witness, who killed the guy, and then you send somebody to jail from one witness, you're a bad judge. Uh huh. You got to call who killed the. Guy. You got to ask ten different witnesses who killed the guy. Yes, yes. So it's the same thing. If you want to say, "Am I going to have any children?" You shouldn't just ask Jupiter. Yeah, Jupiter is okay. one of the people you should ask, but you also should ask the fifth house, the fifth lord. You should also ask the Saptamsha. Oh, okay. Right. So you want to cross ref, cross check with other witnesses who know about the same topic. Oh, okay. See, okay. All of the witnesses are saying that this person has a great love life. The only problem here is the 12th Lord in the fifth house. So our interpretation is they're going to have a good love life with a foreigner. Oh, okay. Awesome. This is how sophisticated astrology is. You have to really be flexible and your brain has to be able to have many options open. Okay. Figure out what the final option is. That that's a very good interpretation. Love with a foreigner. <laughs> okay. Then the parivartana. Yeah, prominent houses with dustanas. That parivartan. Yeah, I found that Mantreshwar and Paladipika, you know, uh, delineated that concept. So it seems like it's quite a valid concept. Uh -huh. That if the parivartan is going between. Kendras and Dushtanas, then it's called, he calls it a Dainya Parivartana. Aha, uh -huh. yes. Which means like not such a great one. And then there's other ones. Konas and Kendras are Rajogas. Ah, yes. Yeah. He's had another one. I can't remember what his other terms. In practice, I just find that because there's so many variables with astrology and it's so sophisticated. Yes. Sometimes counterproductive to to literally apply the basic rules. Like in, okay. in practice, I find that you need to see on a case by case basis what a parivartan is likely to do. Okay. Like, okay, what if we say the fifth, the seventh, and the eighth parivartana? That matches okay. your description, right? You get a kendra with the dushtana, or okay. should it be sixth? Seventh and sixth? Yeah, fifth and sixth, for example. Or okay, seventh fifth and sixth. sixth. Fifth and sixth. So, well, fifth is the Kona. Yes. Does that count? Yeah, I mean, if you take the Lords of the Trines as important planets. Okay. Yeah, and you put it, put it. So, yeah. yeah, you don't really um, come off the bat thinking like, this is a great Parivartana Yoga. Yeah. Because it's with the sixth house. So you're linking something, the fifth house, to problems. Or enemies. Okay. But keep keep in mind that you have a. This is what actually I do for the people that take the courses that I do. I teach them the basic, the baseline interpretation. This is your baseline interpretation of like fifth lord in the sixth house. Okay. Okay. But remember, this is the baseline. You will modify Not this anything. based on the conditions. So the the baseline of a parivartana with the fifth and sixth house is probably something like loves enemies and therefore is weak. Okay. You know, is is too too kind to enemies, um, has problems, 
has problems being too soft. Okay. Five is love and six is enemies. But you could see okay. it go another way. Five and six is very important for the Shanka yoga, which okay. is the yoga of being independently intellectual and able to okay. do your own career, like start your, start your own business or do your own, have an independent career. Uh-huh. You have to, this, the relative position of the fifth and sixth Lord is so important. Mm-hmm. So fifth and sixth Lords doing a Parivartana maybe indicates this intellect is really good at solving problems, practical problems. Because it okay. implies its intellect. So think about the planets involved. Not just don't just leave it at, oh, this is a Parivartana between five and six, I'm done. You have your basic um, interpretation of Parivartana between five and six, but then also think about what kind of planets are what are the planets involved here? What is the dignity of the planets involved here? What else is going on in the chart? Yes. And another uh, very important question many, many times we get is, so suppose you have a good planet or suppose, I mean, the seventh Lord is well placed or there's a good planet in the seventh house, yoga, karaka, or a natural benefit, suppose. But then your natural significator of marriage, Venus, that is very badly smashed somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Then how do you interpret? Do you say that, okay, Venus in general will represent women or men for women. And then uh, your because your seventh house is damaged, then that means your uh, first marriage or first relationship will be difficult. But then you see the second house for the second marriage. Or how do you say if one of them is damaged? Well, I mean I the Karaka or the seventh house or seventh lord. Right, I understand your question. So what if what if one of your witnesses is saying, ah, this is a great marriage, yeah. and the other witness is saying, it's a terrible marriage? How yeah. do you make up your mind as a judge? You got a complicated situation. Yeah. Make it at face value. You, the face value is that the chart is very complicated on this issue, right? Yes, yes. And so that's your interpretation. The person is has a complicated love life. Okay. <laughs> They are going to have some areas in life where they're good with, with their partnerships and their marriage and their love life. And they're going to have some times or some aspects of the relationship where they're awful with it. Okay. Now you can look into the details of what planet is it? Or why is Venus being smashed? Or why is the seventh house being blessed to figure out what are the areas of relationship in which this person is good? And what are the areas of relationship in which they're bad? So it's, that's where it's complicated. It's not all the same. When it's all um, the same, it's easy. You either say it's all good or it's all bad. But where it's complicated, but most it's always complicated. Frankly. Yeah, some malefic will yeah. aspect the seventh lord or seventh house or Venus. <laughs> yeah, because that's also life. Life is always complicated. It's yeah. very, very um, complicated in a good way. We can say sophisticated. It's never just simple like, oh, this is good or this is bad. It's always a mixture of everything. Yes, and one last question I wanted to ask you is, we always say that the whole chart has to be seen. The flow yeah. is very important. Yeah. So when you consider the flow of the chart, I mean, and flow can be anything that this person will be a politician or he will be a murderer or he will be a, a singer or anything. But basically what the person is, that's the flow of the chart. So uh, which are the areas you give the highest importance? Because I see some people taking the Ascendant Lord, some say no, no, Tenth Lord is more important. Uh, so I and have, some, the sun moon is more important irrespective of where the lagnesh is so yeah. i have a huge system okay for that for calculating that i think i wrote it out in php code which is like a computer programming language and i think it's <laughs> upwards of 600 lines or something oh to my <laughs> so there's a lot a lot of system but some of the details are First of all, we should always start with the eastern horizon. Okay. Any assessment of a chart should start with the eastern horizon, the ascendant. Okay. okay. Because that's actually literally where everything begins. So always go there for, to, to get like your sense. What I call it is like a pulse or a first impression. Uh -huh. I think you're calling it like a flow, like where yeah. you're coming from. Where I would say where you go to get your first impression of the chart, is you go to the eastern horizon, look at the nakshatras first. Look at the nakshatra that's ascending and compare it to the moon's nakshatra. Okay. If they're on the same page about things, those things are going to be great. 
if there are if they're conflicting about things those are there's your problem areas as the background you're judging like you know like flow comes from say a spring right it comes from out of the ground from a spring and then the river flows so when you look at the ascendant you're finding the spring ascendant the nakshatras yeah and then look at the rashis and say what's the navamsha and how does it compare with the the regular rashi the regular sign the full sign you know is okay. it the gemini portion of sagittarius or is it the cancer portion of sagittarius or whatever well, how is the um, rashi and the navamsha ma- matching together get your sense of that then go and do the tally yogas there's a lot of shankha yogas shankhya, sankhya yogas sankhya yogas. so you can count up a bunch of stuff and that's helpful because um it's make it makes you look at the whole chart before you look at anything specific like count the elements count the modes of the signs i i also count nakshatra types okay and you'll get a pulse like there's tons of fire in this chart or there's tons of dual mode or there's tons of bitter nakshatras and not not okay. any sweet nakshatras or there's bitter and sweet nakshatras you get a overall picture of the chart okay and then what you have to do is you have to figure out you have to figure out which planet is prominent okay and how do you take the prominence of the planet as yeah. the kendra or trikon or sign wise you take the prominence yeah well first of all there's some sense of that like of who's owning what okay a planet that owns a kendra is obviously more important than a planet that owns yeah or something that yes. the house is out of the way that's just but that's one factor see my, my inspiration from this comes from the shadbala calculation and okay how much calculation uh-huh. goes into shadbala you realize how, how much should go into calculating prominence. Shadbal is very close to prominence. Okay. It's your raw strength. So first of all, do a Shadbala. Get your Shadbala and you'll know how much strength they have. But you also have to say how much chance do they have to use their strength. Okay. Remember we were saying the good person who, the person who loves you but has no power versus the person who loves you but has lots of power. What if the person who loves you has lots of power but no chance oh. to meet you? Okay, that means that the dasha of that planet doesn't come, or maybe the dasha doesn't come, or they they're not lined up with the ascendant. They have no influence on the first house. They have no influence on the first lord. Oh, things like that. They don't own an important house. Then they have no chance to control something important in the chart. Even if they're strong, they don't get any chance to use the strength. Okay. So okay, factor so the they're... factor the shadbala against the, all these considerations. Is it conjoining the ascendant is so important? If if the planet's conjoining the ascendant, it becomes really prominent, more so than being in the 10th house. Okay. Yeah, this also I wanted to ask you in the short note that suppose there's a planet in the Lagna and there's a planet in the 10th house. They say that 10th house dominates the chart. It should dominate the chart, but if it's, consider how close it is to the actual cusp. Okay. Which I would say, which would be the ascendance degree in whole, if you uh-huh. use sign houses, right? So, you know, if you have a planet in the first house that's right on the, look at Krishna's chart. He's supposed to be moon rising. And yes. He's to have his moon rising in like 16 Vargas. So oh. He's have like Taurus rising like all over the place. So no. it's supposed to be bam, bam, bam. So it should be right on the ascendant degree. He's born at midnight on an Ashtami. So the moon should literally be rising. So oh. that moon rising would be more prominent. Does he have anything in his 10th? By Surdas's chart? I don't think he does. But let's say if he had a planet in the 10th house, even if the planet's in the tenth house, if you have a planet right on the ascendant, it's not just exactly. in the first house; it's right on the ascendant. Or how close uh-huh. it gets to the ascendant increases uh-huh. the prominence. You know. Another thing about the tenth house is it will decline if it gets crowded. Like if you just put one planet in the tenth house, that planet has a lot of prominence. Okay. If you put two planets in there; and they're not sharing it. They're not both getting that that prominence. They're, they have to share it. In other words. Oh. So that because only on one stage, person can sit in the throne is it because of that something like that it's like being on a stage like the 10th house is really oh. a stage so one person is on the stage everybody looks at him two people are on the stage some people are looking at this one some people are looking at that one okay and if they are having the same agendas like for example if there's mercury venus then that can be a bit better i guess because then they will have that yeah. friendship also yes yeah. okay but just talking about the prominence Okay. If the aspect, the aspects are very important for prominence too. Okay. It's not just conjunctions, but if planets aspect the first house, the ascendant degree. Okay. If they aspect the first lord, if they conjoin to the moon, 
Okay. It's almost as important as conjoining to the ascendant. Okay. Lots and lots of considerations to take into. So this is how this is how you go ahead. First the ascendant, then the nakshatras. Then you see is it resonating with the moon nakshatra, and then Shambhala. You tally up things and then look for the prominence of the planets, and then you want to okay. base your chart reading around the most prominent planet. Now it's not always that you'll get one prominent planet. Some some people yeah. have like three that are almost the same. But anyway, then you have to sort that out. That's not as easy for the astrologer. Yeah, that's the whole process. <laughs> yeah. But actually, five times out of ten, there's like one planet that's much prominent, much more prominent okay. than everybody else. Just that's easier for an astrologer. Okay. You can, right away, you get like, okay, this is what this chart's all about. Whatever that planet represents is like the main backbone of the most important things in that person's life because it's such a prominent okay. planet. Everything else is much lower. Okay, okay. Nice. Amazed. <laughs> no, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for coming. And Thank you. I hope you'll come again some yeah, I would love to. very soon. And I hope everybody, whoever has not subscribed to his channel, whoever is seeing this, they please subscribe to his channel. And if you have any questions, queries or comments, then you can ask. And I'm very sure he will reply. And I'll pin his, you have a website also, I guess. Yeah. It's just my name. Yeah, so like yeah, yeah, so I'll pin it down in the comments. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you so Once much. Again. Yeah, no Thank you. Wait, let me, I'll stop the.